Several years ago, I started a project to reach out to religious groups to address the global conservation challenges that we all face, particularly to get traction on climate change. And to share with you how I now approach this work, I want to share some wisdom I learned from a Jewish theologian named Martin Buber and some painful lessons I learned along the way. Martin Buber says that as humans, we have two ways of engaging the world. The first is subject object. He calls this the I it relationship, where the it is something to be utilized. I totally get the I it relationship. I'm a scientist. My it is my data. We scientists love our data. We love our detailed graphs, our thousands of data points, and overly long PowerPoint presentations. We get really, really attached to the content on our slides. And as scientists, data is one of our greatest assets, but it can also be our Achilles heel. I learned this when I was in Manus, Papua New Guinea. I was asked to go there with a group of conservation scientists. We were asked to help a community to assess their vulnerability to climate change, particularly sea level rise, and to explore ways to respond. So armed with my laptop and my PowerPoint presentation, I landed in Momote Airport. And then we took a bus to a boat ramp, and then we took a uh, boat to the island where we were gonna be doing our workshop. And when we got there, we took a bus around the outside of the island. And as we were driving, I passed coconut palms where all of the roots were exposed. Family gardens that had been completely destroyed by salt water. And whole sections of the coastline that had completely eroded. And suddenly I became extremely uncomfortable. Here I was coming to talk to these people about climate change and what was causing it and they were living it. What happened next, in retrospect, uh, was completely ridiculous. So I want you to picture this. There are five conservation scientists. We're surrounded by a group of about 20 to 30 villagers from Papua New Guinea. Our feet are in the sand. We're under a thatched hut. We have a white sheet hanging off the edge of the hut for our PowerPoint screen. And we have a generator for power. And we went through slide after slide, after slide, data point after data point. A half meter to one meter rise in sea level by the end of the century. Massive coral die off due to just slight changes in ocean temperature. A 26% increase in ocean acidity since the industrial revolution. Well, it won't surprise you that the real insights came when we shut off the presentations and we started to talk. We talked about how these villagers had traditionally dealt with hazards, things like coastal erosion and flooding from storms. We talked about what new strategies might be necessary to deal with the added stress of climate change. We talked about things like replanting coastal vegetation, planting mangroves to protect those shorelines from coastal erosion, from flooding from storms and sea level rise. We talked about experimenting with salt tolerant crops like taro, which is an important food crop in the region. But then I heard one of the most fascinating and creative responses to climate change I had ever heard. In Manus, land is traditionally owned and inherited. The villagers there told me that they were partnering, making family alliances with families that lived on high neighboring islands to secure land for their future in the face of sea level rise. That's genius. That is just the kind of creative problem solving that we need to tackle problems like climate change. But after a decade in conservation science, I realized I'd made a huge mistake. I thought we just needed to focus on the science, on the data, on the it. But I was wrong. I realized that we will never solve this problem with our science alone. People don't change the world because of more data. They change the world because they're motivated and inspired to do so, because they care. People care because they feel that they have a moral or a spiritual obligation to make the world better. 
because they feel connected to something greater than themselves. And this connection inspires action. It took me a trip halfway around the world to realize that in order to solve the problem of climate change, we need to allow ourselves to be vulnerable, to be open, and to connect in true dialogue. I realized that I needed to go halfway around the world to really understand the second way that Martin Buber says that we engage the world. He calls this the I-thou relationship, where we engage with our whole being and we have an active relationship with the object we encounter. This is more than just a way of relating to others. It is, according to Buber, how we experience the presence of God in our world. That's pretty powerful stuff. You can imagine that I didn't share this with my scientific colleagues. So now I should confess to you that I am not one of those people who learns a major life lesson and then changes the way they operate. No. It takes me a few times of being banged over the head with a hammer before I change the way I operate. What happened in Manus was hammer number one. This next journey is hammer number two. As conservation scientists, we warn that species are going extinct at alarming rates. Habitats are being degraded and destroyed. Identifying and analyzing the problem is essential to generating action. At least this is what we tell ourselves. But it's a downer. Forget economics is the dismal science. Climate science really has a corner on doom and gloom. Take the fact that we've lost 20% of the world's corals. That's a real problem, especially for places like Palau, a small island in the West Pacific, where the people depend directly on those reefs for their food and livelihoods. If any of you have ever been to Palau, you know that getting there is a labor of love. From the United States, it's a 30-hour flight in a cramped airplane. You arrive in the middle of the night, and you collapse. But if you're lucky, you wake up the next morning. You drag yourself out onto a boat, and you're surrounded by the rock islands. Mushroom-shaped limestone islands rising out of turquoise blue waters, covered in thick, lush green vegetation. It is breathtakingly beautiful. So we were in Palau to survey the northern reefs. We were there because eight years before, these reefs had experienced increases in temperature and the corals had largely died off. In 1998, there was an El Nino event and it had ca caused unseasonable uh, ocean warming. And it actually led to one sixth of the world's coral reefs dying. Palau was particularly hard hit with 90% of the corals lost in some places. And this reef in the northern part of Palau was particularly hard hit. We jump in there not knowing what to expect. We were blown away. It was absolutely covered in just beautiful, branching, healthy corals. Thousands of fish in every color of the rainbow. But this reef was special. It was far from human populations, so it didn't experience sedimentation and pollution. It had healthy populations of fish that helped to keep the algae populations in check. But what was really remarkable was that this reef was not alone. Coral reefs across Palau have seen incredible recovery following coral bleaching, even those that are adjacent to human communities, in large part due to local management efforts. Actually, we were with a group of uh, scientists from Woods Hole shortly after that, and they discovered that in this protected reef in Palau, corals were thriving in highly acidified waters that were once thought to be so acidic that they were uninhabitable by corals. So while not the norm, these stories provide much needed evidence of not only coral's ability to adapt to changing conditions, they provide hope in a narrative dominated by doom and gloom. And when we share these stories and these successes, we remind ourselves that our actions can and do make a difference. In order to move beyond our climate paralysis, I realize that we need to provide hope as well as warnings. And now, Hammer number three. This one really hit home. Um, I am not a typical conservation scientist. While my colleagues were out studying coral reef ecology, I was studying world religion, Hinduism, Taoism, Christianity, Orthodox systems of Indian philosophy. I then I built my scientific career. 
I joined the Nature Conservancy, and I got my PhD in climate science. So when I started this project to reach out to religious groups, I figured, I've got this in the bag. I can do this. So I presented my strategy to a group of leading Nature Conservancy scientists. And when I finished, there was dead silence. Nobody spoke. Until finally, because scientists like to question, one of them looked at me straight in the eye and said, what do you believe? What's your faith? And I froze. I panicked. I could not answer a question. I had a religion degree. I was baptized in confirmed Episcopalian. I even spent time living in a Buddhist temple. But none of that came out of my mouth. At that moment, I desperately wanted to be able to say, I am a Christian and mean it, or identify with a particular faith, but I couldn't. And I felt like not being able to do so, I was somehow inauthentic, or worse yet, a hypocrite. Who was I to lead this global effort if I couldn't identify with a particular faith? You see, the truth is, I don't have a straightforward answer to that question. I can't state my beliefs in a few declarative sentences. My answer is messy, it's complex, and it certainly wouldn't fit neatly on a PowerPoint slide. As scientists, we often hide behind our data. There's a safety and an anonymity in measurements and numbers and projections. There's a safety in falling back on prescripted bullets on a PowerPoint slide. There's a safety in using the same ways to tell our story. But what we really need to do, especially on this issue of climate change, is to allow ourselves to be open, to be vulnerable, to connect. Connection requires us to move our conversations beyond simply what we should do and how we should do it to much needed discussions of why we do it. I needed to be able to answer my colleague's question about my faith, difficult though it was, so he could understand why I do what I do. Thankfully, now I appreciate that my motivations are absolutely the central core of this work. Indeed, they're where true partnerships can be built. I'm grateful for what I've learned over the past decade as a conservation scientist. And you should be too. You'll notice that I'm standing here today without a PowerPoint presentation and I left my generator at home. But more importantly, my experience has helped me to understand what Martin Buber was really talking about. True connection requires more than just talking and listening. The real insights at this conference will come when we engage in true dialogue with each other, even when our beliefs are messy and complex, and even when they differ. For when we do that, as Buber says, we allow ourselves to feel compassion for everyone and everything and generate a loving responsibility for the world. Thank you.